all for the music. That was great. Thank you, Brother Joe, for your testimony. And uh, we need to be in prayer for them. As a former missionary, I know Brian and Amy, um, upheaval like that is difficult. And uh, sometimes on this end, our thought is, well, man, you guys should be happy you get to come home. But actually, they left home. And, uh, and they left where God's called them to do, and that's a difficult thing. And uh, pray for their kids. I remind people of this sometimes. When you're brought up on the mission field, when your children are brought up on the mission field, they feel at home in what we consider a foreign country, and they feel like foreigners in what we consider their home country. And, uh, and so those things, those, there's a lot of difficulties in there and emotional struggle. So um, hold them up in your prayer as well as other missionaries uh, during this time. Well, we're still, uh, I want to encourage you to not forget who's your one. I've not mentioned this in several weeks, and um, I've had people at different times come up. Someone said, my, my one got a different job, and they don't work in my office anymore, so I'm praying for another one. Uh, but don't forget that. Uh, ask God to bring people in your life. And again, that one may come and go. That one may be just for a couple of days or weeks or, or an encounter. Or it may be a loved one, a neighbor who you've been around for years and you'll still be around for years. But ask God to work in their lives. Ask God to give you opportunities to share and pray for their salvation, even if you're not the one that's directly involved when they come to the Lord. It's still part of that process of uh, planting the seed, watering the seed, but in the end, it's the Lord that brings uh, forth the, in, uh, the increase. Welcome, children. Uh, the last Sunday of every month, we have our kids in here uh, from Children's Church, and I'm glad that you can be with us this morning. Don't forget after the morning service to meet uh, my wife and me down the hall, and if you've behaved, we'll have a treat for you. And I'll leave that up to your mom and dad to decide because every now and, now and then a family goes by and says they don't get a treat today. So uh, anyway, we're going to open up in a word of prayer. And this morning we're going to pray for Hope City Church and Pastor Scott Newton. Uh, very quickly, on Sunday mornings there's four or five pastors that we text each other. Um, Grace Baptist Church, Union Grove Baptist Church, uh, Triad Journey Church up here, and there's a couple more. And the text that came in this morning uh, came from Pastor Josh Evans, and he just said, Good morning, brothers. Uh, don't forget to preach the Word and stay out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do the work. And uh, I love the fact that there's several, that there's a lot of good Bible preaching churches in our area, and we as pastors are friends. We eat lunch together, we pray together, we encourage each other. Because in the end, we might have a different local church name, but we're all part of the church. We're all on the same team, and we're all preaching the same gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's pray for Hope City this morning and Pastor Newton. Father, thank you for a beautiful day that you've given us. Thank you, dear God, that the sun's out and, and uh, the birds are singing and creation is doing what you intended for it to do. It's declaring your glory. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray for the other churches in our area that faithfully preach that, specifically this morning. We pray for Hope City. We pray for Pastor Newton. And I pray, dear God, that as they preach your word, that it would go forth in power, that the Holy Spirit would use it in the lives of that congregation. And we pray the same thing, Lord, this morning here at Faith Church. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10, as you already know this morning. William Borden was born in 1887 into a prominent and wealthy family. It was not the Borden Milk Company family. This William Borden, his dad, made his fortune silver mining in the state of Colorado. William's mother became a Christian in 1894 and attended a church in Chicago that became the church that is now called Moody Church. William came to faith in Christ in that church under the preaching of R.A. Torrey. Some of you will recognize that name. When William graduated from high school at 16, his parents gave him an around-the-world trip as a graduation gift. Kids, you might ask your parents for that and see their reaction. 
During that trip, he attended a church service in London where he surrendered to full-time ministry. As William continued his trip through the Middle East and into Asia, he became burdened for the Muslim peoples living in that part of the world. He wrote home and indicated to his mom his desire to become a missionary. One of his buddies on finding out about this expressed frustration and claimed that Bill's going to waste his life. In response to this, he reportedly wrote in his Bible, No Reserves. William went on to Yale College in 1905 and then to Princeton Seminary later on to get a seminary degree. When he finished, he turned down several high-paying job offers and finalized his plans to go to the mission field to work with Muslim people groups. It's reported that on embarking on this trip, he wrote two more words in his Bible, no retreats. Before moving to his field of service, he had planned to spend a year in Egypt in order to study Arabic. While in Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis and within a month was dead. He was only 25. As the story has it, one of his co-workers got possession of Borden's personal effects. In those was a Bible. In the Bible, this co-worker found what Borden had written. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. William Borden was totally dedicated to the Lord. We're going to see another young man this morning whose relationship with wealth caused his life to have a different outcome. I'm going to go ahead and read through our verses again, starting in verse 17. And as he was setting out on his journey, Jesus, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This narrative is also found in the book of Matthew and Luke, and it seems to indicate if you take all of the passages and put them together, that this young man was not only wealthy, but he was a religious leader. As Jesus' fame grew, this man had heard about Jesus' teachings and miracles, and he approached Jesus with a simple question. Jesus, being God, recognized that the question was based on a faulty understanding and an erroneous perspective. In other words, this young man, in spite of his financial and religious success, had a distorted perspective of himself and of what God requires. And we're going to look at three of those this morning. His first distorted perspective was he believed that human beings are basically good. In verse 17, he we find as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now this man viewed Jesus as just one of many Jewish rabbis who lived during that time period. These Jewish rabbis would gather a following. Their disciples would live with them, eat with them, travel with them learning that rabbi's philosophy on the Old Testament law. Jesus had gained more attention than most rabbis because of his miracles, as well as the distinctiveness of his teachings. However, this young man still viewed Jesus as just another human rabbi, and we see in verse 18 Jesus' response, and Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, if you read that on the surface, it seems almost a little nitpicky. It's almost like, well, Lord, he had a sincere question. Why are you picking apart his words? Well, because Jesus is God, he recognized how this young man was thinking. He recognized the perspective behind the question. Jesus recognized that he was all wrong in his way of thinking, because this young man viewed humanity as basically good 
and especially himself. Why do you call me good? No one's good except God. In other words, you view me as just another human rabbi, and you have called me good, but only God is truly good. See, Jesus was confronting here that young man's perspective about himself and about all of human humanity. You know, this is a point where all religions get it wrong. This is a point where most human beings get this wrong. Humanity is not basically good. Outside of the work of Jesus Christ in our heart and in our lives, we are not good. Our character, our, our heart, our being is not good. That was Jesus' view. That's the view of Scripture. And ultimately, that's God's view. You know, this makes us feel a little uncomfortable. It makes, uh, actually, in modern culture, this uh, brings us in, in contrast with how modern culture thinks. But I want you to understand something with this point. If we get this wrong, we get it all wrong. If you cannot recognize that humanity is not basically good, you can't be saved. That's why Jesus died on the cross for our sins. The central teaching of the gospel and of all the Bible and especially the New Testament is that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. If you have never been confronted with your own sinful condition and acknowledged it, you can't be saved. Because in your heart, there's nothing to be saved from. This was the view of this young man, and it put him at odds with the truth and at odds with God. So before Jesus dealt with the question, he went after the young man's worldview. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. His second erroneous perspective is also found in verse 17. He thought that doing was more important than being. Verse 17, and as, I, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, he thought that what he did was more important than who he was. Now, the two perspectives that he had wrong here uh, meet together. If I am basically good, and that was his view, then of course all that I have to do to earn God's approval is to do good things. So the question was based on faulty viewpoints. Humanity is basically good, especially me, was his thinking. And doing is more important than being. So his understanding about himself and about the world were wrong. And he failed to understand the whole purpose of Scripture. And by getting it wrong, he got everything wrong. I was trying to think of how do we illustrate this to help us understand. Having the wrong worldview, having the wrong perspective on these two um, issues would be like putting the wrong address into your GPS and, th and then following it. What would happen if you wanted to go to Greenville, South Carolina? That's on my mind this morning because my daughter who lives in Greenville is with us. What if you wanted to go to Greenville, South Carolina, but you put an address in your GPS to Greenville, North Carolina, and you didn't realize it, and you were like the modern kids, you just started following what your GPS said, where would you end up at? Would you end up in the wrong or right destination? See, having the wrong worldview on who we are before God and on what's the most important thing to God will lead us to the wrong destination. It'll lead us to the wrong outcome. Now watch what Jesus does. He knows this young man has a wrong perspective and worldview. He knows how the young man thinks. Verse 19, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Now, where do these commands come from? Those are the Ten Commandments, right? In fact, those are the last six of the Ten Commandments. Very interesting what Jesus chose to, 
to tell him and what he didn't. Those are the last six of the Ten Commandments. Jesus skips over the first four commandments. The interesting thing about this is that the first four commandments deal with being, and the last six commandments deal with doing. Jesus also knew this man was going to have the wrong response to what he said in verse 19. Look at verse 20. And he said to Jesus, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Now again, remember, he viewed himself as basically good. He viewed doing as more important than being. And his thought was, I've done everything I'm required to do. I haven't missed a thing. I'm on target at this thing. And by the way, he was probably a very moral man. He was most likely an observant follower of the law of Moses. He had gained a position of religious authority. Outwardly, this young man towed the line. Outwardly, he was probably that religious person doing all of the religious things that he was required to do. This leads us to his third erroneous perspective. Number three, he failed to recognize or realize that he was an idol worshiper. Verse 21, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Now let's understand quickly here, Jesus was not telling him or us that in order to go to heaven, we have to sell all of our material goods and give it to the poor. Remember, Jesus knew this young man's heart. Jesus, as God, recognized the heart behind the question. Jesus recognized the perspective behind what this young man was seeking after. As human beings, we cannot see into another person's heart, mind, or thoughts, but Jesus can, and Jesus knew that he was guilty of idolatry. Jesus knew that this religious young man loved, trusted, and served his possessions and wealth more than anything else in the world. Jesus knew that these things stood in the way of him trusting in God. So Jesus went straight to the heart issue. Are you going to love God more than anything in this world? Or are you going to love your wealth? Are you going to trust in God with all of your being? Or are you going to trust in your wealth? Are you going to be loyal to God with all that you are? Or are you going to be loyal to your possessions? Verse 22 answers his response or gives us his response. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. Now here's the point. That young man had broken the first four commandments. What Jesus didn't say tells us a world about the situation. See, this young man was guilty of breaking the first four commandments. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. This young man had another god in his life. This young religious leader trusted another god, his wealth, more than he trusted the creator God of all the universe. He broke the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself any graven image. In a way, he had constructed an idol that he loved more than God, the idol of his wealth, the idol of his possessions. He loved and served that idol more than he loved and served God. He broke the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This young man claimed to love and serve and obey God with his mouth. I've kept all those commandments. I've not missed a one since I was a kid. But in his heart, he was loyal to another God. So he claimed God with his mouth, but it was in vain. He also broke the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath. As a Jew living at that time period, he would have faithfully observed the Sabbath day outwardly. But he couldn't observe it in the heart because he was already worshiping something else. He was worshiping his wealth. See, outwardly, this man had kept all six commandments and had probably done a pretty good job of it. 
But by breaking the first four, he was guilty of breaking all the commandments. This young religious leader was unwilling to yield to God. This young man who was rich and very religious, a very dangerous combination. I want to add something to this thought of being wealthy because if you are like me, you've read through this before and you've thought, well, I'm not rich, so this doesn't really apply to me. The poorest person in this room this morning has more luxuries and material possessions than that young man ever thought about having. He had an outhouse. They cooked over a fire. There were no air conditioners. There were no padded furniture. And I could go on and on. Also, if you earn $30,000 a year in your household, you're in the top 2% of the world's income earners today. And I'm talking all 7 or $8 billion. 30000 a year, top 2%. My point is this, this narrative, this historical event is for every one of us. So this takes us to the point of our whole message, which is the word repentance. Back in Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, we find this account. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now what's remarkable about those two verses, those are the first words of Jesus in the gospel of Mark. That's the first thing that Jesus said. The first command in Mark from Jesus' lips are repent and believe the gospel. Now, repentance and belief are not two separate things. They're two sides of the same coin. When a person has spent their life trusting in and loving themselves, their sin, their religion, their money, their lifestyle, their idol, and then that person is confronted with the gospel message that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, the message of the gospel is not to just add Jesus to the mix. Are you with me? We're not just adding Jesus to everything else we have in our life. We're not just adding Jesus to all of the other gods or idols that we have in our life. It's either Jesus or your idol, but it can't be both. And that's what happened to this young man. This is what repentance is about. Repentance is turning from those idols that we love and trust in and trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior. And as small as this may seem, but when I gave my testimony last week, I mentioned when I was in that pew battling over whether I was going to be saved or not and trust in Jesus as my Savior, in my mind I thought about my friends and the parties that we enjoyed and the other things I had going on in my life. And there was a battle between those two things in my mind and in my heart at that moment. And thankfully for the work of the Holy Spirit, I was able to repent from that and trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Going back to the rich young man, I think he would have been fine to add Jesus to everything that he had going on. But it doesn't work that way. What this young man needed was repentance and belief. He needed to turn from trusting his wealth to trusting in God. Repentance and belief. He had spent his entire adult life, from what we can tell, trusting his wealth, trusting his religion, finding his joy and fulfillment in those things, and he was confronted with the truth. In a way, Jesus said, those things are your gods, but you can't have two gods. It's either the God of the Bible or your God. Repentance is recognizing this and turning from your God, little g, to the God of the Bible, the gospel of Jesus Christ, big G. You know, as human beings, this is one of our, this may be our greatest barrier. And it may not be wealth, it could be a lot of different things. We're fine with God and Jesus as long as they don't get in the way of our lifestyle, as long as they don't get in the way of our desires. We're fine with God as long as following Him doesn't cause us to have to change too many things. 
And as I'll just mention, we can do this with many things. Our emphasis with this young man is money and possessions. Education and career can become idols. Relationships, even good relationships, can become idols in our lives. Sports, recreational activities can become idols in our lives. Addictions such as drugs, alcohol, pornography become idols that people bow down to and worship. Another and maybe even more dangerous idol is religion. Religion was the... Let me start back. Did you know that religion was the greatest obstacle to following Jesus in the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The sinners did fine with repentance and believing in Jesus. But it was the religious people that fought against that. See, the Jewish people of Jesus' day had built a religious system that had become their God, their idol. The very God, or the very people of God, the children of Israel, rejected their Messiah who had been sent by God because they had allowed their religion to become an idol that replaced God. Sort of hard to get your mind around. They worshipped their religion and rejected God in the process. And that brings me to us and what I want to conclude this message with. This is probably the most dangerous thing for faith, church. Yes, many of you and all of us can be tempted by the other idols, the money and wealth and, and relationships and sinful idols that create uh, addictions in our lives and careers. We're all susceptible to that, but a church like Faith Church is especially susceptible to allowing a religion to take the place of God. We're a church that preaches the Bible. We believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a solid history of this. In fact, our church was founded over the gospel and the trustworthiness of the Word of God. But here's my question. If God's chosen people of Israel could turn the Old Testament and the teachings of the Old Testament into a religious idol, don't you think that we could fall into the same trap? And I wonder how it happens. And I was thinking about this. How could that happen? How could a person here fall into that trap, hearing the gospel, singing the songs, yet over time find themselves worshiping traditions and religion more than God. Well, a person or family who's part of faith church over the years, it would be easy to become stagnant in their walk with the Lord or maybe even to never be a believer to begin with. You come into a good church like our church and there's sort of a system at work, a good system. But you learn the system, you learn the language, you become active in the church activities and ministries. In your heart, as human beings are wont to be, you think that you're basically good. You become more interested in doing than in being. And without even recognizing it, you begin, you begin to worship the idol of religion. Now, like I said, any of us can get caught up with any idol. But my point is that if it happened to the children of Israel, God's chosen people, our church practices and traditions could very easily become an idol for us that we start to trust in and believe in more than God. And I'm not going to go through a list of religious things that people might worship. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to do this work in, in our lives if, if someone's falls into this category. My burden, though, is that there are people right here at Faith Church who are just like this young man that we've studied this morning. That's my burden. And I don't have anybody in my mind. I don't, I don't do that when I preach. I, I clean my mind up. But my burden is that, that there are people here whose worldview of themselves is that they're basically pretty good, and they become more concerned with doing rather than being.
And they develop idols in their lives that keep them from trusting in Jesus Christ and trusting in God. But religious idols, religious practices, religious traditions. You might know the gospel, you could repeat it, but deep, deep down, your love, loyalty, and trust are in another God, in an idol. And you could love your religion more than you love God. You could trust your religious traditions more than the gospel. And that becomes your idol. And that becomes an obstacle to you believing in Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if Jesus were to ask you to get rid of that idol, would your response be like the young man's response? And to turn around sadly and walk away because you love your idol so much. In his case, it was wealth. And I don't know what is it in your case. Because again, my fear is pastor. I feel a burden. I would hate more than anything to, to end this life and find out that there were people here who spent years, decades at Faith Church and never came to faith in Jesus Christ because they were deceived by the, the, the traditions of religion and never came to faith in Jesus Christ. And I have a responsibility to stand up here and say this. There's only one thing you can do. Repent. And believe the gospel. Repent. And believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to finish with Jesus' words. And I'm going to ask our musicians to come forward and lead us in a song. Here's what Jesus said. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. If you need to do that this morning, you can do it in your seat. You can do it at this altar. But I beg you in Jesus' name, if you have an idol in your life that's keeping you from the gospel of Jesus Christ, repent and believe.